Doing uh, pretty good. I'm here with uh, Brad, our shape shifting vision casting leader, and Drago, our Russian dog. Say, so, hey, guess that TV theme music from the intro, and you'll win a prize. Tell them what they'll win, Brad. Relationship goals, the book, as well as the study guide. If you missed the TV theme music from the um, uh, what did we do? Oh yeah, the, the Adventures in Writing Scripture with Todd White video. Here's the answer to that one. So today we're going to be looking at uh, Rick Warren. He's, uh, he's made the news recently uh, for uh, ordaining women pastors. Uh, but I'm not going to be talking about that. Uh, it was it was very interesting uh, to hear Al Mohler's thoughts on it, and he pointed out that really what Saddleback and Rick Warren has done speaks less to what they believe about uh, the doctrine of um, male and female pastors, but uh, what they believe about the Word of God. It, it has to do with the, with the way that they believe about the Bible. <laughs> Now, guys like Rick Warren, uh, they they straddle a very thin line because they they desperately want to be accepted by uh, the world and to be accepted by the uh, Christian community at the same time. So they they straddle a very thin line. Uh, I used to be under a pastor like that in my old church. It was it was always so much more in what they didn't say than what they said. They were just so close. They really were good at like just, just, just tight walking that little thin line, not stepping too far on one direction or too far on another. Just uh, smooth enough and straight enough to be to not cause any trouble with either side. You see, to neither get in trouble with the world or to get in trouble with the church. And uh, that's how you make a big church like uh, Saddleback Church. Uh, but here in this one, he's going to be teaching an actual. Uh, outright false teaching, uh, the law of positive attraction, which is which is a false uh, teaching. It's it's not taught by the church. It's never been taught by the church in the last two thousand years. It's basically the same thing we saw um, Gary Kesey teaching in the use the force with Gary Kesey video. But anyway, uh, here's Rick and the law of attraction. You know, before we look at God's Word today, I want to encourage you to pause this video and print out the outline. Get your notepads out! Otherwise, you're not going to remember the 10 transforming life principles that I'm going to share. You simply aren't going to remember them because there's too many of them. But this is one of those messages that honestly could be a life-defining message for the rest of your life. The bold promise, Rick. And I want to share with you 10 laws of spiritual planning. They're all right here in God's word in the Bible. Uh, but to set up these 10 laws, I want to first read a parable of Jesus. It's called the story of the growing seed. And it's found in Mark chapter 4. All right, so he, he called these 10 laws. Now, when he puts it into the category of law, biblically, it means a moral law. So if we're not obeying them, we are disobeying God's moral law for righteousness. But he's not talking about biblical moral law. He's going to be talking about natural law, like gravity, like cause and effect, like internal combustion. But Jesus didn't come to teach us science. I mean, that goes without saying, doesn't it? Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like this. Somebody plants some seed in the ground. And then during both the day and the night, whether that person who planted it is awake or asleep, the seed is growing silently. Now, the person who planted the seed can't see how it's growing, because obviously it's hidden under the ground. But in the darkness, the soil is helping the seed to grow. And first, the plant sprouts through. 
the soil. That's always exciting to me. And then the tender stalk appears. And then the stalk puts on buds. And finally, the full head of grain or fruit appears. And then when it's ready and ripe, the farmer cuts it because it's harvest time. Now, in this simple parable, we have Jesus clearly saying that if you want to understand the kingdom of God, and you want to understand, understand how life really works, then you need to understand the principles of planting seeds. Well, I mean, not exactly. There's, there's more to it than that. And again, he began to teach by the sea. And again, he went back to teaching. Now, what had just happened in chapter 3? Jesus had had it out with the false teachers in public, those who were trying to kill him. Jesus, it seems, sowed a lot of love and truth, and all it got him was hatred and persecution. And then his family came, seeking to see him, and Jesus said, My family are those who do the will of my Father. So here we have Jesus sowing, and his sowing isn't producing good things, it's producing curses from the false teachers, who actually accused Jesus of being a devil. Jesus came to show them God. They said, He's from the devil. And then his sowing also produced division in his human familial categories. I'm not sure that you're reaping what you sow, but anyway, the, the chapter goes on. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables. Why did he teach the people in parables? Well, we'll see. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. To you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Parables were a judgment upon the Jews for rejecting their Messiah. He's quoting from Isaiah there. So parables were not given so that we might divine life principles from them, but to hide the gospel truth of the kingdom of God from those who had rejected it. Now Jesus tells two parables of sowing in this chapter, and he relates sowing to sharing the gospel. Sow the seed of the gospel everywhere, because we don't know to whom it has been given to know the truth of the gospel, see? That's why we give it to everybody. We spread it everywhere. It's all about spreading the gospel. The seed is the gospel, and that's all it is. It's not your money. It's not your talents. It's not your faith. It is the word of God, the gospel of Christ. And Jesus goes on. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. So we don't really take principles or laws from the parables. We let the disciples explain them to us, and they do. They tell us all that we need to know for life and godliness. The parables were not given to lead us to life and godliness, but to take life and godliness away from those who rejected the life and godliness God provided in Jesus Christ. All right? All right. So what lessons can we quickly draw from this story? Let me suggest uh, four simple lessons from what I just read, and then we're going to look at the laws of planting, spiritual harvesting and planting uh, in Scripture. But here's what we learn from this parable. Number one, God expects growth. Okay? That's the first thing. That's the kingdom of God. He says, here's what the kingdom of God's all about. God expects growth in my life and in my church. A growth in life and godliness, in, in righteousness. That, that is what growth is. Um, Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 2 Timothy 2.22 So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Uh, 1 John 5.18 We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God, who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Romans 8.4-6 in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have set their minds on the things of the Spirit. 
For to set the mind on the flesh is death, to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Um, 1 Peter 2, 4, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. James 3, 18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Uh, Hosea 10, 12, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. <clears throat> but um, Rick isn't talking about growing in righteousness. In my life and in my church, growth is the evidence of God's kingdom at work. In fact, so many of the parables and stories of Jesus reinforce this truth. The righteousness of Christ in our lives is the evidence of God's work. Romans chapter 8 is a whole chapter about that. Um, I don't know why the thing froze up. It just I guess it's my computer. It's been dropped too many times. But anyway, the, the audio is still, still going. That God expects us to grow up to spiritual maturity. He doesn't want us to stay as busy, as babies. And God expects us to, to grow his church. And God expects us to grow his kingdom and to seek first his kingdom. And, and it's righteousness. That's what Jesus said. But again, Rick isn't talking about that. A second thing that we can learn from this, this truth, uh, from this parable, is that any fruit in my life, and that's good fruit or bad fruit, could be either way, any fruit in my life comes from seeds planted by people. Now listen very closely here, because this is important. This is gold. The seeds that are planted in your life are either planted by people around you, or they're planted in your life by you yourself. That is not what Jesus said in this parable in Mark 4. The seed is the word. Uh, Jesus said that. We give each other encouragement from the word of God, to be sure. That is what the proverb, iron sharpens iron, means. But again, this is not what Rick is talking about here. He's talking about the little negative and false words that we plant in each other's lives and that we sow in our own lives. And did you note that phrase that I read in that parable? It said, somebody plants, someone plants. Who is that someone? Well, that phrase isn't referring to God. It's referring to a human being. Uh, the seed is the word of God. Jesus said so in his explanation of the parables in uh, Mark 4. So you need to ask yourself this spring a couple questions. Here's the first one. Real important question. Who am I allowing to plant seeds in my life? Uh, here we go. Got to, get, got to get rid of those negative confessors in your life. He says nothing about the word of God here. Just, just seed. Just positive seeds. Just positive confessions. Now, he doesn't say that. He doesn't call them positive confessions and negative confessions. He leaves it up to you to make that connection. And people are quite happy to make it. Uh, people getting rid of negative, toxic people all around them, confessing them out of their lives. Husbands, wives, children, it doesn't matter. Got to keep my soil pure from their toxic negativity. Second, do I want the kind of fruit that will grow from the kind of seeds they're planting in my life? And if not, you want to change it. See, it's important to understand that the people who plant seeds in your life that doesn't just include your family or your face-to-face -face friends or your co-workers. In fact, a lot of people plant seeds in your life. I plant seeds in your life. I'm doing it right now. I do it every week. Define irony. Now, if you watch TV or you listen to radio or you listen to podcasts or you use the Internet or you use social media, you are letting all kinds of people plant all kinds of emotional and mental and spiritual and secular seeds in your life. I'm Susan. You can't power yourself out of this, but you can still think. And in your heart. That's why, as your pastor who loves you deeply, I deeply urge you to be more discriminating in what you watch and what you listen to. And what you read. Don't just allow anybody to plant seeds in your life. My spider senses are starting to tingle. You see, if you're spending more time reading Facebook, 
than having your face in God's book, you got your priorities out of order. <laughs> Very clever. Having your face in Facebook, not in God's book. We're, we're not hearing anything from God's book right now. This parable was not written to teach us how to exercise our lives of toxic negativity, emotional stressors and triggers and whatnot, but that, that doesn't matter, Rick. Why don't you start planting some good seeds in your own life? You say, well, what are seeds? Well, seeds can be ideas. Seeds can be convictions. Seeds can be perspectives, a new way of looking at things. Seed can be habits. Every time you start a good habit, you're planting a seed that's going to bear fruit in your life. The seed is the word of God. That's what Jesus said. <clears throat> the scriptures, they are able to make us wise unto salvation. They produce righteousness, righteousness in us. The apostles taught us, you know. The ones to whom Jesus explained the parable Rick is teaching, uh, they actually taught us this in the Bible. Relational seeds. Two is always better than one. You can plant financial seeds in your finances. Yeah. Money. You can plant personal seeds in your character. Moralistic therapeutic deism. You can plant family seeds in your family. Bobby. And you can plant career seeds. Well, it's happening. Now, there's a third lesson we get out of this parable. We can extract from this story, and it is this. We often can't see the seeds that are growing in our lives. And I'm not just talking about the good ones. I'm talking about the bad ones, too. What seeds? There is one seed, the Word of God, that is what Jesus said. Both the good seeds that have been planted by you and your choices and by others and their choices. Good seeds and bad seeds. Notice that Jesus said in that verse, the person who planted the seed can't see how it's growing. But that's why the, we sow the seed everywhere. We sow the gospel everywhere. Broadcast sowing. That's what it's called. That's what he was talking about in Mark chapter 4 when he's talking about the parables of, the, of sowing the seed. We don't see some people and say, eh, they don't need the gospel. They've got all they need. We don't see people and say, yeah, those people are terrible. That's bad soil. The gospel won't grow there. I think I'll sow the gospel over here where it'll grow. This is about sowing the gospel. <clears throat> Jesus could not have been more clear in Mark 4. But that's not what Rick is talking about. Now, there's a fourth lesson we can see in this, and it's this. Growth in my life is slow and gradual, and it happens in stages. Growth in righteousness, sanctification, the process of being made holy here on the earth, a proper reflection of the righteousness of Christ. It, it does take time. It does happen in stages. But that is not what Rick is talking about. He's talking about growing in your career and your relationships and your finances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The best way to do that is to cooperate with what are called the 10 laws of spiritual plan. Now, who calls them that? Who, who calls them that? No, no apostle called them that. No apostle ever told us about no 10 laws of spiritual planning. <clears throat> However, Rick here says that if it's imperative that if we want to grow, we have to cooperate with these laws, these laws that no one knew about until now. Well, I take that back. Some have known about them. There, there are a few others who call this the uh, 10 laws of uh, spiritual planning or whatever. Uh, they teach pretty much the same thing that Rick is uh, teaching here. Uh, here's, here's just a few of them. Harvest only responds to seed. Say that out loud. She sowed a prophet's quarter and reaped a child. I was rejoicing. Somebody sold 1.5 million into my account. Ain't no harvest coming because you say, oh Lord Jesus, you understand, Lord help me. You say, I do understand. When I talked with Dr. Roberts today and we talked about it. This seed faith thing. He said something awesome. He said the Bible says giving and receiving, but he said God has taught me by studying that word receiving that another way to say that word is receiving. Find you some piece of money. Find you something to sow. If it is money, you you need whatever the harvest is. You need to come up with money. You will have to sow money. The word receiving means receiving. And so he said when you give, you get a receipt. In heaven. What am I saying? Name your seed. That when you have a need, you can then go with your receipt. And say, you see, God, I have got my receipt. 
Until the seed is sown, the harvest is not in you. is what connects a believer to heaven's blessing. Debt is what connects someone to the world's curse. He said, we don't give to get something back. Oh, yes, we do. From my sowing, and now I have a need, and I'm cashing in by receipt. A man came to me and said, Brother Mike, when I give to God, I expect nothing in return. I said, I wrote a little song how dumb thou art. And if when you hear, when you sow, put your, put your words on your mouth. That is God penetrating your heart. It's burning on the inside of you. And you need to make a vow of faith of a thousand dollars. Oh, Bob, couldn't you say 25? No! You can't make a thousand dollar foul of faith. I'm saying in faith. So we got people that don't have teenagers that have no, hardly nothing going for them. They got enough faith to make a thousand dollar vow and send them five dollars here and ten dollars there as God begins to move like a whirlwind in their life. Your destiny is in your sowing. Your destiny is in your hands. I'm talking about what God says. And if you want the kind of miracles that are in the Bible, you're going to have to do what God said to do. See faith. What is it? And what does the Bible say about it? It actually means the application of faith through or according to the seed principle of life. I want them to stretch out their faith and I would like them to sow a $52 seed for 52 weeks of favor. When you give to God, you give in faith, which is an herb-bearing seed in the ground that comes up and produces 30, 60, and 100 fold, and all the blessings of God are yours. This is hot soil for anyone that's got the faith to sow into it right now. Now, Rick doesn't say anything as ridiculous as, uh, as these people are saying, but he's, he's teaching the same principles, that the very same things that they teach from the Bible, Rick is teaching here. Uh, they just make the, um, the direct application. You know, they, they, they talk about what they're really talking about. Rick doesn't go that far because, like I said, he, he's an expert at straddling the, uh, straddling the white line, as it were. Um, but Rick is worse than these uh, because he's teaching me the same thing they teach. Now, when somebody hears a, a Kenneth Copeland or a, or a Joyce Meyer or a, a Creflo Dollar saying the things they say, uh, they think, well, yeah, I mean, Rick Warren teaches that. He, he's pastor of a Southern Baptist church. He's, he, he's, not, a, he's not a prosperity preacher. He's, he's you know, he's... He's a, he's a he's a real you know evangelical preacher and all that, and so they think well okay so Creflo yeah he's preaching the Bible to me he's preaching the same thing uh, same thing old Uncle Rick is preaching to me see. God set up the universe to run on both physical and spiritual laws both of them are inviolable. Physical laws, the laws of physics, and spiritual laws, the laws of the spirit. Now, we learn the physical laws of the universe by studying God's creation. And when we look at nature, we learn the laws of physics. We learn the spiritual laws of the universe, not by studying nature, but by studying God's word. This reminds me of the Gary Keithy video, using the force. Spiritual laws are like the force. They're out there. You've just got to tap into them. They work every time. That is not what Jesus told us here in Mark 4. But, you know, let's, let's let Rick finish. He's, he's the megachurch pastor and all. It's just such a convoluted argument. I mean, okay, yeah, there's natural laws, uh, and then there are spiritual laws, but we're going to derive a spiritual law from a natural law? No, Rick, that, that's not what we're taught in, in the Bible. I mean, what, what spiritual law do we derive from gravity? You know, <laughs> what spiritual law do we derive from, um, you know, the law of internal combustion, you know. Well, I mean, some of these NR, NAR folks, <laughs> I'm sure they have. But, you know, for the rest of us, yeah, that, that's not how the Bible is to be interpreted. Okay, you got your pen and pencil out? Write these down. Here's the first law. Everything starts as a seed. 
Every idea started as a seed of an idea. Every dream started as a seed of a dream. Every achievement, every building you see, somebody had the seed thought in their mind. Your own life started as a seed. Now, Rick, that's natural law. I mean, God didn't start as a seed, and he exists. Love didn't start as a seed, but it exists. Righteousness didn't start as a seed, but it exists. Light didn't start as a seed, but it exists. In fact, in the beginning, God didn't create seeds. He created things that produce seeds. So this is not a spiritual law. And I mean, anyone can obey this law. Adam did. Lost people do. But lost people cannot obey spiritual laws. Paul says this in Romans 8. And, you know, Jesus, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the righteous branch of Jesse, the promised seed of Genesis 3.15, when he came, he only sowed good seeds. And what did it get him? It got him killed. All the apostles only sowed good seeds, and it got them persecuted and killed. Now, he, he's going to go in here and start talking about life producing after his kind. And we know the gospel application of this. When Adam was cursed, he only produced cursed things. Romans 5. Cursed things produce cursed things. Blessed things produce blessed things. But but he's he's not making that application here. He's not making a spiritual law. He's making a natural law. Laws about natural things, material things like finances, health, relationships, careers. Now the, these uh, prosperity preachers they they say the same thing Rick just said here. But then they'll go on to tell you that you know it applies to everything. Um, uh, material things. If you want material things, you got to sow material things. If you want money, you got to sow money. Uh, and this, this, and that. So you can see where this where this teaching goes. They say, you know, everything starts with something. Starts small. So you know, even if you only got twenty five dollars, you got to sow it. You know, got to sow that small thing to get the uh, to get the big thing. You, you've heard it. You've heard him say that. Second law. A seed has no power until it's planted. A seed has no power at all until it is planted. The, the word of God has no power until it is planted because Jesus was talking about the word of God in Mark 4. He said so. And again, this is natural law uh, Rick is talking about, not spiritual law. Everybody knows a natural seed will not grow unless it's planted. And you can see where the prosperity heretics take this principle. That thousand dollars in your bank account ain't gonna do no good just sitting there. You gotta plant it in good soil, namely my bank account. It may just be possible that you think you're waiting on God when God is waiting on you. You're waiting on God for that ideal job. Promotion! You're waiting on God for a spouse. Will I ever get married? You're waiting on God for some offer to come in. It's a dollar! I, I want to suggest that maybe God is waiting on you to start planting some seed. Uh, you can suggest that all you like, but God doesn't wait on anyone. God does what he wants when he wants to. It sounds just like the word of faith uh, prosperity heretics. I mean, you, you can see. You can see how they say that very same thing. Principle number three from God's word. Some seeds should be planted instead of eaten. You know, we use wheat to, you know, we pound it down and we make bread with it. But some seed shouldn't be turned into bread. Some seed should be planted instead of eaten. Right. Like the false teachers of Israel said, you don't need to eat. You need to give. Remember the widow's might? You know, the prosperity gospel is more morally reprehensible than a Las Vegas casino because it masquerades as religion. They take your money in Las Vegas, but you expect it. Because it's run by the mafia. You don't expect the people that represent God to do the same thing. And when Jesus saw the widow put her last mite into the temple offering, he said, this temple is going to come down. Not one stone will be left on another. I don't know what you have been taught about that story of the widow giving her last two cents. That was not an example of Christian giving. God doesn't expect you to give your last two cents and go home and die. That's what happens to a widow who is suckered by a religion of works. 
She was trying to buy with her last two cents her way into the kingdom because that's what she'd been taught. And Jesus says any system that sucks people down to the place where they have nothing left in a false hope is coming down. And it did. And here's the fourth law. Uh, whatever I plant is what I'll harvest. Right. So if you want to harvest money, you plant money. If you want to harvest a wife, you, well, I, I don't know what you'd plant for that. <laughs> in biblical New Testament Christian terms, God plants righteousness in us. Seriously, that's what is happening when you become a Christian. You are declared righteous in heaven. You are made righteous here on the earth. God actually prepares works of righteousness for you. This is what Ephesians 2 says. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. But that's, that's not what Rick is uh, talking about. He's talking about marriages and money and careers and whatnot. Number five, fifth law. I'm not the only one planting seeds in my life. So you got, got to get rid of those negative confessors like the prosperity teachers tell you. Yeah, those people tell you to quit listening to me. They're just speaking negativity into your life. You, you can't have that um, in your life. You realize that? You're not the only one planting seeds in your life. I mentioned this earlier, that you are reaping both the good and bad from those who went before you. Ancestors, family members. There's a curse on our village. The curse of Frankenstein. With a little generational curseism thrown in for good measure. Uh, this, this, this breaks my heart. Uh, I see what this does to people in, in Africa. Here's the sixth law. None of these laws are from the Bible. You realize that. He's just, he's talking about the, the characteristics of, of a seed, the science of it. And he's making spiritual application with that. And that is not what Jesus did. He explained what he did. He explained what he was talking about in the parable. We're not reading the parable. We're not studying the parable. We're listening to Rick's observations on what it means to be a seed. I harvest in a different season than I plant. Now, and, and you're going to notice that all of Rick's spiritual laws here are equally obeyable by believers and non-believers. Uh, these are, these uh, apparently these are spiritual laws. He's calling them spiritual laws that non-believers can obey. Uh, non-believers can please God in this way. Like you don't harvest in the same season you plant, right? That's a universal law. But then, of course, the prosperity teachers will come in and say, yeah, <clears throat> I know you sowed a seed into my ministry so you'd get some money yourself and you're a little worried because you haven't gotten it yet, but you got to wait. You got to wait for the reaping season, etc., etc. So that's just another law. I hope you're writing these down. Here's the seventh law. Very important. This is the law of multiplication. I always harvest more than I plant. So see, don't be scared about sowing the money seed you set aside for your mortgage payment because you're always going to harvest more than you plant. It's law. It's a spiritual law of God. One of the ten, like the Ten Commandments, you know. Here's the eighth law. I increase my harvest by just planting more seed. Hey there, Mr. Prosperity Preacher. I sowed a seed and I haven't got the money you promised me. The double, triple, hundred-fold return of the fat stacks of cash. Well, you know, you, you got to keep sowing. You stop sowing, that's your problem. The more you sow, the more you get. See, you got to keep sowing. I remember a, a leading CEO of Orange County one time saying, Rick, any time you teach on giving or tithing, you need to tell people the best time to start tithing is when they're in debt. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the, they want God's help to get out of debt. You're not going to get out of debt on your own. He said, decide in your heart, not reluctantly under pressure. God loves a cheerful gift. Right. And, and giving so you'll get out of debt. That's, that's totally the, the correct motive, right? That's the motive that pleases God. Uh, I need to get out of debt. I better give God some money. He's referring to 2 Corinthians where Paul was talking about giving to further the preaching of the gospel. When you give to that, you will reap gospel benefits, not money, souls. 
and also it will please God. It pleases God when the gospel of his son is preached. Nowhere in the New Testament does, it, does anyone tell us that if you want more money, you should give more money to God. No one. I mean, just think about that for a minute. But God says, hey, you guys want more money. You need to give me some more money. <laughs> That's not the God of the Bible. But that God sounds like the God of Kenneth Copeland. Now, the law of generosity works for anybody who follows it. It'll work for a non-believer. I've known non-believers who became incredibly wealthy because they learned the law of generosity. Now, wait a minute. Rick told us these were spiritual laws. Unbelievers cannot obey spiritual laws. It says so in Romans 8. It says this explicitly. Here's the ninth law. We got two left. The ninth law is this. I should always be planting seeds. Always be giving your money to preachers and false teachers of the temple, just like the widow with her last mite. Finally, here's the 10th principle, all right? I wish I had more time to go over all these, but here's the 10th law of spiritual planting. The law of spiritual planting, planting that, that's what he calls it. But listen to what he's saying. He's saying you plant spiritual things and you reap material things. Or... You plant material things and you reap spiritual things. He's mixing material and spiritual things together. Fleshly things and godly things. Profane things and holy things. He, he's... While I'm waiting for the harvest, I must be patient and not give up. Right. Don't give up on the word of the preacher who promised you you'd get out of debt <clears throat> if you gave him money. This is awful. The, the thing that bothers me about this is, like I said, Rick is a considered a, a mainstream preacher. You know, he pastors a Southern Baptist church. He's not, you know, considered in the same ilk with, uh, you know, Creflo Dollar and that bunch. But so when he comes out and he says these things, like I said, it gives credibility to those those over there on the other side, and it's just it's terrible. I hate it. I mean. I've seen what it does to people firsthand. They give and they give and they give and they give until they have nothing left to give. And then still, they do not inherit eternal life. They go doubly bankrupt to hell. They've given all their money to some preacher. And they've missed out on the riches of Christ and his righteousness. It's awful. God bless y'all. Uh, Talk to you again soon.